So, I hope you enjoyed it. But I'm back. All right. So, we're going to be embarking on a new journey. But all these things, you know, even though we have different topics, different subjects, they all lead to the same place. They all lead to intimacy with Jesus Christ. That's where we want to be. Intimacy with God, that's where you find everything you're looking for. That's where you find salvation. That's where you find love, joy, peace, contentment, power. It's all right there. That's where you find healing. That's where you find deliverance. That's where you find provision. It's all right there in the presence of God. Uh, In his presence, it's fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. What else could you want? But it's in his presence. And his presence can be elusive because we live in a world that is distracting. We're going to be embarking on a journey called the power and beauty of holiness. The power and beauty of holiness. So we're talking about holiness. Holiness is a subject that people don't like to talk about anymore because that's kind of old school holiness. Oh, it's going to get into legalism now, you know, all that holiness stuff. You know, I wouldn't talk about holiness if God didn't talk about it. But if God talks about it, I should talk about it too. Let's turn to Psalms 29.2. This is where we'll start this journey. By the end of the journey, my desire, God's plan, is that you see holiness as a very living, integral part of your life, that it's something that you look at, and you see the beauty, and you see the power, and you experience it in holiness. So Psalms 29.2 says this, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Well, you know, that's, you can read all kinds of scriptures, and you just read in words unless you take them to heart and say, I want to make sure I'm doing what the word says. Because we don't want to be those that are deceived, that are hearers of the word, but not doers of the word, Right? You see, some people go to church because they want their ears tickled, right? Now, we should be coming to church because we want our spirits to grow, our spirits to grow. So, which is more comfortable, though? Tickling our ears, that's more comfortable. You know, we were with uh, my, uh, some of my wife's family last night, and there's this young man named John, and he's uh, embarking in the ministry He's uh, in a Korean church, and uh, he's all built up, kind of like going Patrick's direction, you know, getting all really muscly, and he works out like almost every day. So we're talking to him and talking about church and various things, and I said, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of something. The way that you, uh, though you don't like working out, though it's an effort, though it's a struggle, you work out almost every day. Because you're looking to get some kind of physical growth out of this, some muscle growth. Isn't that right? So you do what's uncomfortable because you're looking for growth, right? I said, you know, it kind of reminds me of churches. You can go to church because you're going there, and it may take some work, but you're you're interested in spiritual growth. That's what you're interested in. That's why you go there. And so I said, what would it be like if you decided to stop your workout regimen that you do And instead of going to work out each week, each day, you went to a masseuse instead and you just got massaged every time. Well, he says, well, my muscles probably feel pretty good. Yeah, but they wouldn't grow, would they? You see, we can talk about all the things you want to hear that will make you feel good about yourself, but there will never be spiritual growth. So sometimes... We've got to be willing to say, hey, there's something I need to do in my life. I need to change some things. I need to work on some things. I need to be willing to hear the things so that I can spiritually become a champion, right? So holiness is something a lot of people shy away from. Holiness is, uh, that's that stuff, you know, preachers used to preach a long time ago. Holiness is quite foreign to most people. The word scares many away. Some even hate the word. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And in God's eyes, holiness is beautiful. Holiness is beautiful. I remember an old saying that my mother used to say. My mother's a very non-critical person, very non-judgmental person. She's, you know, one of the best examples of of Christian life I've ever known, and she's not a Christian. I mean, she lives a very uh, loving, caring, selfless life. 
And so she doesn't say bad things about people very often. But she did have this one saying, if somebody or something or, you know, was extremely hideously ugly, she'd say, that's as ugly as sin. You ever heard that? That's as ugly as sin. That's what my mom used to say. Because in those days, sin was considered ugly. You see, people now look at holiness and they think that's an ugly thing. Oh, it's all those judgmental people, self-righteous people. I don't want any part of that. But sin, oh, we embrace you. We love what you do. Yes, we're all okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Right? As long, I'll make you a deal. If, if you say I'm okay, then I'll say you're okay. Then we'll be okay. You okay with that? But God says, I want you to be holy. Yeah. I remember Crocodile Dundee, or not Crocodile Dundee, the Crocodile Hunter, Steve Irwin. Do you remember him? Steve Irwin. And that man loved his work. He had a passion for reptiles. Okay. Yeah. Like a lot of you, no doubt. So he would look at some slithering, writhing thing coming up out of the swampy goo, and he'd say, well, she's a beaut, ain't she? He's a beaut. And I'd be going, I guess beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Because that's some ugly looking thing. That's as ugly as sin, in fact. But he saw it as beautiful. And you know what? I watched the show for a while. And I got a little desensitized to the ugliness of some of these things. And I started to say, well, that is kind of cute. <laughs> because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And when God beholds holiness, he sees beauty. When man beholds beauty in it, be, uh, holiness, he, he, you know, whatever he sees, really I'm not interested in. You shouldn't be interested in. I should be interested in seeing things the way God sees them. That's the important thing. Because you know what? If somebody's wrong, if it's between you and me, and one of us is right and one of us is wrong, and we can't both be right. Well, if it's between me and God and, and he has a different opinion than mine, he's probably right, not me. So if God sees holy as holiness as a beautiful thing, then it must be a beautiful thing. Man calls sin good and he calls righteousness evil. God sees things differently, but God is right. In God's eyes, one of the most beautiful things that exists is holiness. Holiness. Maybe we should be taking another look at holiness to see what's so beautiful about holiness. Let's look at 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. And uh, I'm reading most of these out of the NIV. It's not my favorite version, but it does make things plain for those that are not that familiar with the King James, so that's why I've chosen it. But 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16 says this. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be ye holy because I am holy. Holiness is something God expects from us, don't you think? He doesn't tell us to do something we can't do, okay? You can't save yourself, so he came and did the job for us. He died on the cross for us, and we just have to accept that. But holiness, he says, you can do that. What do we have to do? Well, holiness is a concept that's pretty foreign to man. Holiness is not of this earth. Holiness does not come naturally to man. Holiness is not something that can be attain, obtained by hard work. Holiness is an element that comes from only one source, and that's from God himself, because God is holy. He's the author of holiness. He's the originator of holiness. He is the fountain from which it flows. He's the source. He's the source. Holiness is not something you do. The holiness will affect everything you do. Holiness is not something you do not do. The holiness will restrain you from doing some of the things that you used to do. If a man desires to truly understand the depths of love, let's take for example, he will have to truly understand the source of love who is God himself. You want to study love, you need to study God. Because God is love. That's what he says about himself. Love is who God is. Without a deeper knowledge of him, we cannot understand real love. 
Love is not, you know, like there's this stupid song. I forget the guy. My wife knows the guy. This guy, he says he saw this woman on a bus. He fell in love with her, but he's never going to have her. Fell in love with her, he saw her on a bus. He's never talked to her one day in her whole life, but he's in love with her. I'm in love. She's on the bus. We'll never be together. I feel so sad. And now my heart's broken because I've been, you know, so deeply in love for five minutes. Does that make sense? It's stupid, isn't it? True love comes from knowing God because God is love. He is the source of love. Love is who God is. Without a deeper knowledge of him, you cannot grasp real love. 1 John 4, 1 John 4 says this, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. There it is. It doesn't say that God loves, though he does. It says God is love. He's the very definition of the thing. He's the source of the thing. He's the originator of the thing. You want to know what love is, you've got to look at God. Outside of God, love is just a word. It's a word you put in songs. It's a word about a one-night stand, making love. You know, got nothing to do with it. Real love comes from knowing who God is, the person of God. Love is who he is. Some people don't understand. I don't know why God loves me because I did all this bad stuff. And even after I got saved, I've been doing all this bad stuff. How can he love me? Maybe he's upset with me now. Maybe blah, 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 blah. It's like you don't understand who he is. God can't help himself. He has to love you because he's love. He can't hate you if he wanted to, though he doesn't want to. He can't because he's love. It's his nature. His nature. You can't change that. You know, when a cat, uh, you know, is born as a kitten, uh, mother doesn't have to teach it to meow. It's its nature. It's going to end up meow, 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 right? You don't have to teach a dog to bark. It's their nature. It's just going to happen. God is love. He can't do otherwise. So if you want to know about love, you need to learn about God. We do not know or learn about God's love by saying this. We don't say, Lord, give me some time to myself. I'm not quite ready to come before you. Because I don't love as I should. So I'm going to go and work on my love. And then I'm going to get it all straightened out. And then I'm going to come before you full of love. He says, you don't understand. You can't get love outside of me. You get love by being with me. You learn God's love by being in God's presence. Because in his presence, we are transformed. In his presence, we are changed from glory to glory. As we behold his face, we are changed into his likeness. It's in his presence. God is love. And that's not all that God is. The scripture that we read a few moments ago said this. Be holy because I'm holy. God is holy. He's holy. The Lord says, I'm holy. Not just I do holy things. I'm holy. Holy is who he is. He's the source of holiness. Holiness isn't obtained by what we do, but by who we are in Christ. The more we know him, the more we experience his holiness, and the more his holiness is allowed to begin to express itself through our lives, the more we become like him, the more we're changed. He didn't say be holy because I told you to do it. He said be holy because I'm holy. And it figures that if you're my child, you ought to have the same attributes as I do. You know, the offspring ought to look something like the parent, right? If you're uh, from a long line of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people, and suddenly a a black baby pops out with black hair, something went wrong, right? Right? Because that isn't normal. Because uh, if, if all your parents, both parents, are blonde hair, blue eyed for the last 10 generations and a black baby pops out, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that the children of God shouldn't look like God. It doesn't make sense that the children who follow Christ shouldn't uh, look like his image. You see, if you're a long line of, uh, of, of black folks, well, you should have a black baby, of course. If you mix... Uh, a black and a white person, of course, you should have a baby that's kind of a little both. Why? Because they both, they all, everybody who is born bears some of the traits of their parents, right? You're going to bear the traits of your parents. So why is it that Christians think they don't have to be holy because their father's holy? We need to bear the trait of our spiritual parent. It's holiness. It's holiness. And so God says, be holy because I'm holy, and it makes sense. You can be what I am because you're my offspring, Right? You're my offspring. Now, Psalms 51.5 says this. Surely, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You see, it's normal for us to be sinners when we're born the first time 
because we're born from a sinful lineage. And as long as you can go back in my lineage all the way back to Adam, you're going to find there's a bunch of sinners. And it's natural to sin if you're a sinner, isn't it? It's natural if you're born in the flesh that you're going to be a sinner because that's the, just the way it is. You've inherited it, right? Nothing wrong with that. That's just normal. That's just the way it is. We expect that. Romans 3.10 says, that is, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Not even one. Why? Because we've all been born from parents that weren't righteous, who were born from parents who weren't righteous, who were born from parents who weren't righteous. And we, uh, we show forth the image of our parent. So if we by nature, in fact by our genetic makeup, have all been born with a long, from a long lineage of sinners traced all the way back to Adam, then how can we be anything other than sinners? Well, Jeremiah 13, 23 says this, Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin or a leopard his spots? The answer is no. But here's what it says. Can an Ethiopian change his skin? Or a leopard, it spots. The thing is, is, you can't change yourself, but God can change you. The Ethiopian can't change the color of his skin, but I'll tell you, if God wants to make an Ethiopian blonde-haired, blue eye, he can do it. Because he's the one who has the ability to change anything, to do anything. There's nothing impossible. So if God wants to take you, who was born in sin and iniquity, and make you holy, he can make you holy. But you have to submit to him. You can't change by your own efforts. You can't change just simply by desire. Only God can change us. So why then does the Lord lay this responsibility to be holy upon us? We weren't born holy. It's not our fault. We weren't given a choice as to what family we were born in. I wasn't. Isn't that true? However, you are given a choice the second time you're born as to which family you're born in. You see, I didn't get to choose the family I was born in. If I had, I'd probably choose somebody with a different last name. But I got stuck with loud, and that's what it is, and that's the way it is. I can't help it, I can't shake it, there it is. That's the way I was born. It's on my birth certificate. I could change it in, you know, on a business card, but really, that's the way I was born. I'm born aloud, and here I am. But I'll tell you what, in a second birth, we can, be, we can choose our parent. We can choose to be the children of God. We can choose to be born again. There are people that run around the earth and they say, I can't help the way I am, I was born this way. There are people that are born, for example, you don't argue anymore with people who say I was born a homosexual. Maybe they were. Because the thing is, is everybody's born a sinner. That's just another type of sin. Everybody's born a sinner. Of course you were. Of course you were. That's why you need to be born again. You need to be born the second time. Because the second time you can get it right. The second time you can be born from above. And you can be born from the Holy One, and you will become a holy person. John 3, 3 through 7 says this. Uh, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. It says, uh, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. If, you, if you're talking about being born again, that means there must have been a previous birth, doesn't it? We're all born in the natural, in the flesh, and we're all born sinners. And the only way to get out of that mess is to be born again and to be born of someone who doesn't have the lineage of sin but someone who's holy. So it says this, um, Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb? Well, Jesus says, I'm not talking about natural birth. It's another birth. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. You know that. But spirit gives birth to spirit. You must be born again. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you have been born from above. And you are a child of a holy God. And now holiness is a part of your spiritual DNA that you inherited from your Father who is holy. But that's not all there is to the story. If he is holy and we are his children, he says that we should be like him. And he said that we should be holy. But there's still a problem in being holy. And what is that problem? Well, we'll look at, look at Jesus Christ as an example. Jesus Christ is, in, in theological terms, the, the, the theanthropist, which means the God-man. Talking about his dual nature, he's both God and both man. Interesting. He's fully God and fully man. He had two natures. The Bible tells us that Jesus is, is 
God manifested in the flesh. The Bible tells us that Jesus, in him, dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But Jesus was not 50% God and 50% man. He was 100% God and 100% man. But that adds up to 200%, you're saying. No, no, they're two different categories. You see, I once was a single man. And as a single man, I was 100% my parents' child. 100%. I'm now a married man. I'm still 100% their child, aren't I? But now I'm 100% husband to her, right? Well, how can you be 100%? Two different categories. I'm 100% child to my parents still, and now I'm 100% husband. I just added an additional nature, an additional uh, uh, responsibility. Well, God took upon himself the additional nature of man that he might manifest in the flesh, that he might come here, that he might shed his blood on a cross for us, that we might be saved. Why? So we can be born again from above, from above. Amen. Jesus Christ is fully God. He created all the worlds and all that exists in the spiritual realms. But in the fullness of time, at the appointed time that God had beforehand determined, God who is spirit took upon himself the additional nature of a man, and he was born of the Virgin Mary in the flesh. He was born from a woman like the rest of us, and he was 100% human when he was born. However, his being human did not take one thing away from the fact that he was God manifest in the flesh. That is why Jesus had two natures, and that is that of the nature of God and his human nature. Jesus, like us, had to make choices based on the desires of those two natures. So do you. You have two natures as well. One of the two natures for you is a little bit different than Jesus, but you still got two natures. You've got the old man, the one that was born in the flesh, and you've got the new man who's born in the spirit, and those two don't get along all the time. Those two are in conflict. There's a tension between those two. And the flesh says, I want this, I want this. And the Spirit says, I don't want that, I want this. And we make a choice whether to follow the flesh or follow the Spirit. And God says, be holy, which he's saying is don't follow the flesh, follow the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. We have two natures. Jesus, you could see his two natures in the Garden of Gethsemane. There was the human nature saying, Father, take this cup from me so that I don't have to go and die on a cross. But at the same time, his divine nature said, nevertheless, let thy will be done. And he knew he was going to the cross. Both natures present there. His human nature says, I don't want to go and die the shameful death of the cross. He despised the shame. But as God, he said, but I'm going to choose the higher road. I'm doing it. Not for me, I'm doing it for you. And I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'm going to sacrifice my human nature, my human life on the cross for you. He had two natures. We have two natures. His human nature desired to live. His supernatural nature as God said, but I'm choosing to die. He had to go against his natural nature. What was the outcome of the struggle? Well, Jesus followed the Spirit. Jesus was tempted in the desert, 40 days of the devil. What do you suppose was tempted? The Bible says God cannot be tempted. What was tempted was his human nature. His human nature was allowed to be tempted, but his divine nature could not be tempted at all. He was tempted in all points like as we, but yet still without sin. Why? Because he chose to yield to the divine nature, not to the human nature. He chose to do the will of the Spirit, not the will of the flesh. If Jesus had chosen to do the will of the flesh, flesh, the crucifixion never would have happened. And you and I would be sitting here, not talking about Jesus, but talking about, well, what are we, what are we to do to be saved? There is no salvation in any other name but the name of Jesus. If he hadn't died on the cross, where would we be today? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing today. Jesus could have stopped the execution. He could have stopped the crucifixion. At any time, he could have. He had the power to do it. When Peter came, and, and, and he was at the point where the, uh, um, the temple guard came to arrest Jesus, and Peter was going to defend Jesus, and he pulled out a sword, and he's whacking at the high priest guard, you know, uh, right-hand man, chopped his ear off. You remember all that. Jesus said, no, no, hold on, hold on. Don't resist these guys. This is why I'm here. Now, here's what Jesus said. 
Matthew 26, 53 says, Do you think I cannot call on my Father and he'll give at once to put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the Scripture be fulfilled that say I must, that it must happen this way? Jesus said, I could call in a bunch of angels and just stop this thing right now, but I'm not going to because I choose to follow the Spirit. You and I have two natures. Our first nature is the one we were born with in the flesh. We, were, it was, we, we got it you know, automatically. You're born of a woman, you got it. You got the human nature. It's an inherited sinful nature. We are born and shapen in iniquity. We're sinners from the beginning. But when we're born again, we took upon ourselves an additional nature, that of a holy God, our holy Father. The problem is this, that we have these two natures and they don't agree, and it's left up to us to choose which one to follow. That's where holiness comes in. Galatians 5, 16 through 18, I'm going to read, says this. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, he's talking to Christians, yet he's mentioning you've got a sinful nature still to deal with, don't you? Yeah. He say, oh, now that you're a Christian, you don't have a sinful nature. It doesn't exist. Well, it does. It's still trying to say, hey, me, I'm over here. Take notice. It says, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. You notice these two are not in agreement. You're going to have a conflict within yourself. You have to choose which side you're on. And the spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Holiness. People think of the holiness as some kind of legal, legalism, some kind of adhering to rules. But this says the fulfillment of the law, legalism, the fulfillment of it is to be led by the spirit. You want to live a holy life, it's following the Spirit. You want to live a holy life when the struggle is within you to decide between what the flesh wants and what the Spirit wants. You choose the Spirit, and guess what? You're living a holy life. And can you do that? Well, yes, you can. Just as easy it is to say, uh, I, can, I can grasp hold of sin because I was born a sinner. It comes natural, naturally to me. Just as easily we can say, I was born from above. I can grasp a hold of holiness. That's natural to me also. That's my other nature. That's my born-again nature. God tells us to be holy. He doesn't tell you to do, do things you can't do. He doesn't tell you to do things he hasn't equipped you to do. Anytime God tells us to do anything, it's because he has equipped us and caused it to be something that is within our grasp. We can accomplish it. There's, of course, a little problem. When we were born again, God could have made it easier on us, but he didn't. He could have killed the natural man. You know, when we were born again. Then we wouldn't have that nature. We'd be dead, but we wouldn't have that nature anymore. You're going to find as long as you're alive, the human nature, the natural nature, is still going to raise its head because it's still living. Do you see that it is the flesh man, the descendant of Adam, that keeps trying to draw you back into sin? That's the one that says, hey, let's go my way. You know? I mean, that's that little childish part of you that, you know, like when you are a little kid, you thought it was okay that you could just survive on cookies and ice cream. And that adult said, no, no, that's not good for you. You need some nourishing food, right? Well, God knows what's good for us spiritually. And if we go by the flesh, we're going to end up dying. But if we go by the spirit, we will have spiritual life. When you die, you will no longer have two natures, but right now you do. When you die, you'll only have one nature. and It'll be that holy nature. And it'll be really easy, but right now it's a struggle. You live on this earth, it's a world of conflict. There are all kinds of things around you trying to get your attention, all kinds of things on television trying to entice you, trying to draw you in, trying to suck you in. The devil uses every means. He uses every kind of media, every kind of uh, relationship with a friend that speaks in your ear and says, oh, you know, you ought to do this. Oh, well, don't be like those people. Those people are self-righteous. You ought to go with me to the bar and do what we do. You know, you ought to hang out. You ought to have party a little bit more right? One night stands, they're not so bad. You can just say, I'm sorry afterwards, right? You can get forgiveness later on. You know, the flesh has all kinds of stupid logic, but God says, be holy. Oh, that's awfully hardcore. That's for priests, you know. That's for nuns. I don't have to be holy. I'm human. God says, you be holy. If you're his child, you ought to bear his nature. You ought to look something like him. You ought to listen to who's 
Who's trying to get your vote? Is it the flesh or is it the spirit? If we're led by the spirit, it says we are the sons of God. I'm going to read a, kind of a little bit of a long scripture here. I'm going to read Romans 8, 1 through 9. Now, there's a lot of people that like to quote scriptures that are scriptures of victory, scriptures of power, scriptures of blessing, and they almost never quote them in context because they want to say, here's all the blessings you get without telling you your responsibility, right, right? So here's Romans 8, 1 through 9 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, I've heard that said a lot. I'm not condemned because I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Trying to convince themselves they're free while they're still in sin. No condemnation. So when the Holy Spirit comes to convict a person like that, they go, ha, it's the devil. He's trying to convict me. He's trying to condemn me. Well, I have no condemnation. I can just see it say that over and over. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. None, none, none. But it could be the Holy Spirit trying to say, you're not walking right. You need to turn around. So it says there's no condemnation of those that are in Christ Jesus because why? Because why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free. You know, it's the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. If I follow the spirit, there will be no condemnation in Christ Jesus. No condemnation in me if I follow the spirit. But if I don't, it's another story. It says, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. In other words, in the Old Testament, the law, the written ordinances that were given to you were dependent upon your own self-discipline in your flesh to do them. Well, that can't work. God proved it to us. It says the law was our schoolmaster, and what did it teach us? We can't keep the law because we were sinners by nature. It says, for what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that righteous requirements of the law might be fully met who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. We have to be walking according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what, the, what the, that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. You mean if you're one of these people that has no condemn condemnation, that's following God, you're a person who your mind is on what the Spirit is saying to do, not the flesh. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You realize you cannot please God if you're going according to the flesh. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature. That's the way it's supposed to be. Not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. We're supposed to be controlled by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Those things that all Christians want, those things that often elude us, are the things that we can experience only when we are willing to choose to follow after the Spirit. You see, in this scripture, it tells us things that we're wanting. We want freedom. We want love. We want joy. We want peace. We want contentment. We want the fruits of the Spirit, but we all want it all. We want everything on the menu without paying the price, right? I'll have everything. Well, there's a price. There's a price to pay, and the price is putting death, the desires of the flesh, and giving in to the Spirit of God. So many people want big muscles, don't want to work out. So many people want slim waist, don't want to diet. You know, you can, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride, that's what they say, okay? So it's not in the wanting, it's in the doing. God says, I don't want you to be like these other folks. I don't want you to be the ones that just hear the word and then don't do it. I want you to be doers of the word because the ones that hear the word and do not do it, they've deceived themselves and their whole religion is in, in vain. It's a sham. In the weeks ahead, we're going to journey down a road that's very little traveled, the road of holiness. The Bible talks about there's a highway called holiness. And you might go, oh my God, that's a strict road. You know what? It's a beautiful road. It's a beautiful road. When you begin to see things through God's eyes, you'll see holiness is beautiful. Holiness is pure, clean, beautiful, wonderful. It's like, you know, when you go out in nature and you you break through the woods and there's a beautiful waterfall and flowing stream and green grass. It's a beautiful thing. Holiness is a beautiful thing. But the world has said, you don't want that. That's legalism. Do what we do. Follow us. If it feels good, do it. Right? 
Well, you know what? I find that if it feels good in the flesh, do it, ends up making my spirit dry up. And I'd rather have my spirit feel good because that's everlasting life. The Lord puts before us everyday choices. He says, I put before you life and death. And then he tells the dumb ones, and here's the answer. Choose life. <laughs> Choose life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 23 says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That's the flesh. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true, listen to this, in true righteousness and true holiness. You know, there's a true holiness and there's a false one. There's one that is outward and there's one that is inward. It may sound scary, it may sound difficult, but holiness is a wonderful pursuit. And you don't get holiness, by the way, by just being disciplined. You have to realize you don't get love by just trying to do the right thing uh, to be nice to people. Love comes from a source. It's from God himself. People have pursued holiness through keeping of laws, and they found they've never quite attained to that. They've never quite grasped hold of true holiness because there's a true holiness. Just like love, holiness comes from spending time in the presence of the source of holiness. It comes time, it comes from spending time in God's presence. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. There's pleasures forevermore. In His presence, we are changed from glory to glory into His image. It's in His presence. As we pursue God, how are we going to do that? We say, so we need to pursue God, not holiness. Well, yeah, if you pursue God, you're pursuing holiness because God is holy, isn't He? How do you pursue something? Suppose you're in a police car and you're about to pursue uh, some kind of a suspect. And the suspect pulls out of a driveway in their car and they start driving. And you go, you follow them down the street and you go, I think I'm going to take a right here. And they keep going straight. Well, guess what? You just stopped following, didn't you? You see, when you pursue somebody, you don't make the choice on which way to go. You go where they go, right? There's so many of us that have our life all planned out, this big blueprint. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And God says, but what about me? Aren't you supposed to be following me? By the way, as you're following the guy in the car ahead of you, you don't know where he's going to turn next. You've got to keep your eyes open. You don't know which way the Spirit of God's going to take you next. You've got to watch which way he goes, and you've got to follow closely behind. Because if you've making your own decisions in life, I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to do it that way, you're going to end up somewhere else, not where God is. To follow after the Spirit of God like the children of Israel. You see, they followed after the Spirit of God in the wilderness. They had the tent of the tabernacle. And whenever the uh, pillar of fire or the pillar of, of, of cloud, whenever it moved, they moved. And they didn't just move, they moved the direction it moved because they followed it. We can say we're followers of God, but some of us never look up to see where he's going. Did you know that? The only way you can follow in the Spirit is you have to be in tune with the Spirit. The only way you can be tuned in the, with the Spirit is to be in times of fellowship with the Spirit. As we fellowship with the Spirit of God, He reveals to us direction. As He reveals to us direction, we don't say, but I don't want to go that way. We say, I'm going to go your way. And as you go His way, He blesses you. And you're on a highway of holiness, and that's a highway of blessings, let me tell you. None shall walk up there but the pure in heart. We have to have a pure heart. We have to want to do the right thing. If you want to do the right thing, God will help you to do the right thing. If you want to follow God, God will make himself evident to you so that it will be easier to follow him. But we have to desire to do the right thing. And God says, you're my children. You've been born a second time and you were born with my nature. And my nature is holiness and I want you to be holy like I am. And I want you to be holy so that the world will look upon you and say you are different than the rest of them. What is the hope of your calling? What is the thing that makes you different from everybody else? What is that belief you have within you? What's it all about? And you could say it is all about Jesus and what he did. When you follow the Spirit, you find yourself, you are in the river of God. You're in the river of God. It's the river of life. You're in the river of life as you follow the Spirit. You can get outside on the banks, dry yourself off, sun yourself, but getting in the river, that's where the blessings are. We need to get in the river of God, the direction God is moving. We need to follow his direction. We need to go with his flow. 
As we're there, you find as you travel along the river of life, it says along this river there are planted trees of every kind bearing fruit in every single season. There are blessings on the way of walking with God. There is a blessing in your life. There's protection in your life. There's provision in your life. There's miracles that occur in your life when you're in the river of God going God's way. Next week, we're going to discover how you can wake up spiritually the man that is within you, that one that was born the second time. We're going to learn how to wake up our spiritual man. Next week, you are going to learn what revival is all about because, you see, the thing is, is there's all kinds of people sitting around in all kinds of churches praying for God to bring the mercy drops down and let them fall on me, and God is saying, you know what? Go and get it. Revival is waiting for you. And it's us who stir up ourselves that make ourselves open for God's blessings. And God has a way of blessing those that seek him. Don't just sit here and wait. You, you know what? I've met people who've waited here 30 years and say, well, when's it going to happen? You know what? You can have revival in your own life. And if every Christian had revival in their whole life, you know what? Everybody would be in a revival, wouldn't they? And in fact, your revival might be a little different from my revival such that you could give me something I don't have and I could give you something you don't have as far as some perspective on God, and we can encourage each other. We'll see how easy it is next week to begin a revival within yourself without having to wait for it to come to you. You can actually initiate revival. So I want to ask you to come and go with me on this journey. It will change your life forever if you choose to go. But that's where the choice begins. The first choice is, do I want to follow? Do I want to follow? Let's bow our heads for prayer for a moment. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, for the power of your Holy Spirit, for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. I thank you that we are born from above with your divine nature and holiness is within our grasp as we follow you. I thank you, Lord, for each and every person you have sealed with your Holy Spirit, not just any spirit, but the Holy Spirit. And you are the one who makes us holy as we follow you, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that you motivate every heart that's kind of sluggish right now, that you motivate everybody, Lord, to choose life, to choose to follow you with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength beginning this day forward. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.